These are examples of things called Riemann surfaces. These are surfaces that locally, at each point, look like the complex plane. But these surfaces aren't just any ordinary objects. It turns out that they have a deep link to a field of math called algebraic geometry. This is spelled out in a theorem called Riemann's existence theorem. It gives a profound connection between two branches of math, complex analysis and algebraic geometry. Full disclosure, this is a very deep and profound theorem, usually reserved for graduate level courses in complex analysis. On the other hand, I think that the essence of it can be communicated in an elementary way. In this video, I'll first explain the basics about complex functions, how to visualize them and what their properties are. Then we'll see our first example of a Riemann surface, the so-called Riemann sphere, and we'll see that it has a surprising algebraic property. Finally, I'll be able to state Riemann's existence theorem and why you should care about it. We start at the very beginning with the complex plane C. It's a basic fact that every complex number can be visualized as an arrow in the complex plane. The length of that arrow is called the magnitude of z, denoted z in absolute value bars. And the angle of that arrow with the x-axis is called the argument of z, denoted arg z. Over here, we have a function f of z defined by z to the fifth plus one divided by z to the fifth minus one. The color represents the argument of the output. For example, if the color is yellowish green, the argument is zero. When the color is changed to red, the corresponding argument is 90 degrees, and so on. The wrinkles in the graph are lines of constant magnitude. A region like this, where the lines are very close together, the magnitude of the function goes to infinity. This region is called a pole. A region like this, where the wrinkles aren't densely packed, is a zero of the function, a point where the function equals zero. Now consider this function over here. f of z equals x of 1 over z squared. It looks really weird around the origin. Now this is neither a zero nor a pole. It's something called an essential singularity. Roughly put, an essential singularity is a point where the function exhibits very erratic behavior. We're going to view these functions as pathological. The functions we're going to consider for the rest of the video are called meromorphic functions. Broadly speaking, a meromorphic function is a complex differentiable function, f from c to c, where all the singularities are poles and there are no essential singularities. I should say this is not at all a rigorously correct definition. The precise definition of a meromorphic function is rather technical. Here it is if you're curious. So the attitude we'll take in this video is you know it when you see it. The two functions we saw earlier are meromorphic, but the function with an essential singularity is not meromorphic. We'll view these functions as being good. They have nice controlled behavior. We'll view this function as being bad. They're uncontrollable and we'll ignore them for the rest of the video. If there's one thing to make clear, there are a lot of meromorphic functions on the complex plane. Trig functions, exponential functions, polynomials, rational functions, the gamma function, the Riemann zeta function, and all possible combinations of these things. It's a large and unmanageable space. What people noticed is that if you added a tiny constraint, then the space of meromorphic functions shrinks down to something much tinier, which ends up being more manageable. So what is a constraint? Well, for that, we need a definition. We'll say that a function f of z is meromorphic at infinity if the function f of 1 over z is meromorphic near z equals 0. An example should clarify. Consider the function f of z equals x of z squared. It looks like this. Let's calculate f of 1 over z. So this equals x of 1 over z squared, which looks like this. As we saw earlier, this is not meromorphic near z equals 0 because it has an essential singularity. So the original function is not meromorphic at infinity. The first big theorem of this area is that every meromorphic function that's also meromorphic at infinity must be a rational function, i.e. a ratio of two polynomials. This is really quite profound. A function being meromorphic is a condition from calculus, whereas a function being rational is a condition from algebra. Before we continue, a reasonable question to ask would be, where did this condition of meromorphic at infinity come from? I sort of pulled it out of nowhere. Well, here's a nice geometric way to interpret it. So far, we've been working with the complex plane, C. What we can do is adjoin an extra point, called a point at infinity, to the complex plane. We can visualize this like a sphere. The south pole is zero, the equator is the unit disk, and the north pole is this point at infinity. This is called the Riemann sphere, and we'll denote this by C hat. 
As a set, this is just equal to c union infinity. Now suppose you have a function f from c to c, which is meromorphic at infinity. We can extend it to a meromorphic function from c hat to c hat by simply setting f of infinity to be the limit as z approaches zero of f of one over z. The idea being that as z goes to zero, one over z goes to infinity. Then f is meromorphic at infinity precisely if this map is meromorphic at the point infinity of the Riemann sphere. So that explains where the terminology comes from. We can now restate our earlier theorem using our new language. Every meromorphic function on the Riemann sphere is a rational function. At the start of the video, I mentioned that we'll discuss a deep connection between complex analysis and algebraic geometry. But where's the geometry? To see that connection, we'll need to look at another example, which will make geometry much more obvious. Before we get to that, we have a message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is the best VPN on the internet. If you don't know what a VPN is, it stands for Virtual Private Network. It encrypts all the data sent between your computer and the internet so that no one can steal your information. Now picture this. You've downloaded a movie online, but you've also downloaded a virus. With Surfshark, you can relax and enjoy your movie without worrying about downloading any unwanted extras. As another example, if you use public Wi-Fi in places like cafes, you're vulnerable to hackers. The best way to protect yourself is with a VPN. Surfshark is super easy to use. You download the app, connect to one of their 3200 plus servers in over 100 countries, and you're all set. It's the only VPN to offer one account for unlimited devices. You can use our code Aleph for three extra months for free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's no risk to trying it out. Thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Where we left off, we were talking about the Riemann sphere. Now let's look at a slightly more complicated example. This is the example called a complex torus. Take the complex plane and imagine a square grid overlaid on top of it. Say for simplicity that this point is 1 and this point is i, so that the grid hits all complex numbers with integer coordinates. Now zoom into one square in this grid. If you glue the top and bottom together, you get a cylinder. If you stretch and glue the ends of the cylinder, you get a torus. Now this is referred to as a complex torus, because it's a torus that's cut out from the complex plane. To motivate what we're doing, let's look at an analogy. Take the interval 0 to 2 pi on the real number line. There are two important functions on the number line that keep repeating every 2 pi. These are sine of t and cos of t. Now a basic fact from trig is that these functions satisfy an equation. Cos of t squared plus sine of t squared equals 1. To see the connection to geometry, let's do the following. Write cos of t as x, and write sine of t as y. So this equation is now x squared plus y squared equals 1. What does this remind you of? Well, this is the equation of the unit circle in the xy plane. This gives us a map from the interval 0 to 2 pi to the unit circle. The point t on the interval is mapped to the tuple cos t comma sine t on the circle. As we travel across the interval, the corresponding point travels along the circle. Now, this map is a bijection. We can do the same thing with the square in the complex plane. Just like how sine and cos were periodic on the real number line, we need to find two functions on c which are periodic with respect to this grid. I've displayed here two such functions. These are both meromorphic functions on the complex plane that are periodic with respect to this grid. On the left, you see a function called the Weierstrass p function, p of z. On the right, you see p prime of z, its derivative. Just like how sine and cos satisfy an algebraic equation, these two functions also satisfy an algebraic equation. But it's a bit more complicated. It looks like this. Let's call p of z x, and let's call p prime of z y. We get this equation. So just like before, on one hand we have this square in a complex plane, which you can think of as the complex torus. On the other hand, we have this algebraic set, the set of all complex numbers, x comma y, such that y squared equals 4x cubed plus 4x. This is a subset of c squared, and there's a map from here to here. Given a complex number z, we map it to the pair p of z comma p prime of z. This is entirely analogous to how we mapped the unit interval to the circle by using sine and cosine. There is a bijection between the interval and the circle. 
Is there a bijection between this square and this graph? Not quite. And that's because if you take the value 0, it gets mapped to p of 0, comma p prime of 0. And both of these functions have poles at 0, so you don't really get two complex numbers. To get around this, we have to adjoin an extra point to the curve, called the point at infinity. And the point 0 on the square gets mapped to this. Now, making this precise is a little bit hairy. To do this, mathematicians don't consider this curve as living in C2, but in a slightly larger space called CP2, the complex projective plane. Defining this rigorously would require a whole another video, so to make sure we don't obscure the main point, we'll gloss over this technicality. What is true, though, is that if you ignore this point 0, there is a bijection between this square, not including 0, and the solution set in C2 of this curve. Said more provocatively, this square can be described as the zero set of a polynomial equation. This is really weird. The square is a purely complex analytic object, and yet we've isomorphically mapped it to something which is algebraic. So far, we've seen two examples of spaces that have strong algebraic properties, the Riemann sphere and the complex torus. These are examples of spaces called Riemann surfaces. A Riemann surface, roughly speaking, is any surface with the following property. If you pick any point on the surface, there's a neighborhood of that point which in some sense looks like the complex plane. For those of you who'd like a precise definition, I'm putting one at the bottom of the screen. But for the video, this intuitive description will suffice. What we saw is that these two Riemann surfaces have a strong connection to algebraic geometry. For the Riemann sphere, every meromorphic function on it is rational. For the complex torus, you can isomorphically map it to the zero set of a polynomial equation. So is it true that every Riemann surface can be isomorphically mapped to the zero set of an algebraic equation? It turns out that the answer is no. The Riemann surface must satisfy an extra condition. It must be compact. The rough intuition is that a compact space is a space that doesn't go off to infinity and it contains all of its limit points. But the upshot is, every compact Riemann surface is an algebraic curve. That is, given any compact Riemann surface x, you can map it isomorphically to the zero set of polynomial equations. To be precise, there is a smooth embedding of x into complex projective space, whatever that is, which maps f isomorphically to the zero set of polynomial equations. Okay, so after all these technical details, why is this so profound? Basically, there are two worlds, the world of complex analysis and the world of algebraic geometry. You might think that this world is really floppy, living in the world of calculus and analysis. I mean, you can talk about integrals and limits and calculus and differentiability. On the other hand, this world seems really rigid, like polynomials are rock-solid algebraic things. They seem like they're made of plaster. But the miracle is that these two worlds are actually the same thing. Complex analysis is algebraic geometry in disguise. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next video.